All right, I think we're gonna get started uh, this evening. So uh, first off, I wanna thank everybody for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Rich Ketchup, I'm the Chief Program Officer at US Rowing. And uh, we want to hold this webinar tonight to do sort of a level set on safe sport. Uh, you know, we believe in how critical safe sport is to protecting our athletes. And over the course of the past several months, we've made changes to our policies, uh, how we support that with technology and what the experience is going to look like uh, at our hosted regattas as we approach the season. So uh, we have several folks from US Rowing here this evening, which I think is indicative both of the amount of work that's going into deliver a safe sport experience across US Rowing, uh, as well as how seriously we take this um, as a critical element and our role as the national governing body for the sport. So what we were hoping to do this evening is provide a little bit of a background just to get everybody on the same page for safe sport, talk about what's changed around our compliance requirements, um, walk everybody here through what that actually means in practice, and then provide plenty of time for questions. Um, so, you know, as we look to the hosted racing season starting in less than two weeks, one of the things that we've noticed is that compliance levels are very low. Um, when I look at our youth regional events so far, fewer than 10% of our 18 plus athletes are safe sport compliant. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we need to get the message out and we need your help. So we're hoping from this evening's webinar and then communications that will follow that we can rally and really drive up our compliance percentages in advance of regatta starting. Uh, so uh, regarding the Q&A, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A rather than the chat so that we can track them during the discussion. Uh, we can group them and then we can answer them after we walk through this presentation. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Pam Adler. Uh, next slide, please. So a lot of people ask what is safe sport and um, how it came about. So basically um, an act of Congress created the law, the um, protecting young victims from sexual Sexual Abuse and Safe Sport Authorization Act of 2017. Um, and they created from this the US Center for Safe Sport. The center serves at an, in, as an independent national safe sport organization, and they provide the education and training that you take if you're 18 years or older. Um, and it's the education and training is consistent with the law and it's required by the center, the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, as well as US Rowing. The reason that it exists, the reason that education exists is that is the best way to prevent misconduct. Um, there's many different ways, types of misconduct and misconduct can happen at any level from minors to collegiate to masters, anybody. And we wanna do our part and we want you to do your part to help to prevent misconduct. And I'm going to introduce Tom to take over the next part. Hi, my name is Tom Rooks. I'm uh, just recently started with US Rowing. I work in safety and well being. Um, I look at a, a large range of things that come across as far as safety, but the safe sport topic is pretty dear to my heart um, as a long term athlete in sport. You know, there are a lot of ways we can we can think about uh, safe sport. We can think of it as a compliance uh, requirement, which is it is, but I like to think of it as the best chance we have of stopping us from creating the next victim. And while probably everybody on this call and on this webinar is someone who's you know already passionate about doing the right thing, this training is, if it, it might take a half hour of our time, might take an hour of our time, I think in a worst case scenario, an hour and a half of your day, and for me, that's a pretty easy sacrifice if it can stop one victim from happening within our sport. We love the sport too much. Uh, no one's doing this as a get rich quick scheme. This is something we do because we care about the sport and we care about the people we, we engage in the sport with. So in the biggest sense, I think it's not important, not as important that we just simply go, it's a compliance checkpoint as much as it's something we embrace the principles and policies of to, to better the situation we find ourselves in. And with that, I'll give it back to Pamela. So a lot of people ask, well, what kind of training do I have to do? You know, what, what am I, who am I? So here's the basics of what training you need. Everyone who is 18 years or older is required to take some kind of safe sport training. If you're only an athlete, if you're a master's athlete, for example, you are only required to take the adult athlete training, which is a 30 minute course. 
if you are in a position of power, a position of authority, if you have in-program direct contact with minors, for example, you're a coach, you're a referee, you're a board member, you're an administrator of your club, um, you are required to take the core training. If you've never taken training before, that is 90 minutes. And if you have taken that training in the past, there is an annual refresher course that is on a five year cycle. So every five years, you will have to take the core training again. And then there's also um, if you have no direct contact with minors, but you are involved with your club and you do do things to help out, then you just need to be aware of the minor athlete abuse prevention policy. And we will provide the link later on in the slide. Uh, next page, Sarah. So these are just examples of who needs to take the training if you're um, in a position of authority with direct contact with minors, you do need to take the core 90 minute training or the refresher, as I mentioned previously. And this is just some examples, coaches, volunteers with direct in-program contact. That would be, for example, um, somebody who comes down to the dock every day with minors is helping with the boats, um, parent chaperones, if you're traveling to an event, referees, athletic trainers, um, you know, somebody giving a massage, et cetera. Completely opposite from that, you just need to be aware of the minor athlete abuse prevention policy if you do not have direct contact with minors. Um, these would be uh, people working the food tent. Um, if you are a paid bus van driver to an event, um, if you're just you know, attending a ceremony, a celebration, if you're there for a fundraiser, um, if you're involved with a community service project. Next slide and I'll pass it back to Tom. So when we talk about the map, what we're talking about is minor athlete abuse prevention. And so just as a recent example, the map is not a complicated thing for us to help engage the people coming to regattas or engaging in rowing activities um, to train them up on. I was at a regatta this, this weekend and we spent all of three minutes possibly um, gathering up everyone that didn't have direct contact or authority, but was gonna be in a position where they might see something, uh, observe something and, and giving them the basic training on to, how to interrupt it and how to report it up. Um, to put it real simple, everything we do, and this is the biggest danger zone we found, and it's similar to what uh, scouts have adopted as far as two-person integrity. Everything we do with minor athletes should be observable, is required to be observable. And it has to be interruptible. Um, there, there are situations where people have dual roles. There are coaches with a child on the team. There are personal care assistants. Um, there can be a close and exception. But at the end of the day, everything we do should be observable and interruptible. It's as simple as that. If you look at the link uh, we have on the right side of the slide, it takes you right to the policy. It makes it very clear. And it only takes a moment or two to share with the people you know uh, may need to have this this awareness of this policy at any event you hold. Okay, um, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Pamela. Um, so what you see here is a really quick uh, overview of who needs to do what at a US rowing hosted regatta. So US rowing hosted regatta is an event like the youth series, uh, youth nationals, masters nationals, our masters regionals events like that. Um, so to go over this really quickly, if you are an athlete younger than 18, so you're 17 years of age or younger, uh, you need a basic plus or a championship membership. Uh, you need a signed U.S. rowing waiver, but you do not have to take any training. There is training available for minors so that they can uh, protect themselves better, so that, so that they know what to do if they observe something that they think um, is wrong or is a crime or, you know, maybe requires the attention of an adult, uh, but it is not mandatory to complete any of that training. If you're an athlete, just an athlete, uh, same thing uh, at a U.S. rowing regatta, the basic plus or championship membership, a signed U.S. rowing waiver, and all you have to do is complete the adult athlete training. So not the 90-minute training um, or any of the kind of more extensive courses that are out there, just a 30-minute adult athlete training uh, suffices. Um, if you are a direct contact coach, um, basic membership um, is enough. We do not require coaches to hold a basic plus or championship. There certainly are insurance benefits to doing so, but we do not mandate that level of, of membership. We require you to sign a waiver. And as a coach, you need to complete the NGB1 core course that takes 90 or so minutes uh, because 
you know, that really uh, is what someone in a leadership role needs to complete. Um, if you're not a coach, so if you're not in a role where you're on the water with these athletes, where you're at the venue doing certain things, we introduced on January, in January, uh, a, a new level of, of basically getting into our database. We call it the volunteer option. It's zero dollars. There's no cost to you. U.S. Rowing is absorbing any sort of cost from Safe Sport that comes with that. Um, and, it, and it allows you to sign a waiver and to have access to any and all uh, uh, Safe Sport courses. Specifically, we want people who access the volunteer option um, to uh, take the NGB1 core course, because you might be a board member, you might not be coaching on the water every day, um, you might be in a volunteer role, but you're chaperoning at a hotel. We don't want people in those kinds of roles who are not athletes and who are not coaches um, to have to pay for a membership. So those people uh, just take, uh, they, they access our database as if they are becoming a member, um, but instead they use the volunteer option so they're not being billed people with that role will appear on your roster so that you can see whether or not they've taken to training and signed a waiver. Um, and like we mentioned earlier, if you do not have direct contact with athletes, but you're in a support role that may be different, like you're just volunteering at a dock for a regatta, you're helping out referees, you're a parent at a food tent, um, then we do not require training, but we do require that someone makes you aware of what the athlete uh, abuse prevention policy is. Uh, but like Tom said, again, that just takes a few minutes and there's no membership requirement for those, uh, for anyone in that role. So if you have not yet completed the training or you've completed it before, but you haven't accessed it recently, um, I, uh, uh, we, we have a couple screenshots here. What we want you to do is to go to membership.usrowing.org like any member can. You log in with your member number and your password. And then on your profile, we have a new feature in the menu bar on the left-hand side. There is the Safe Sport icon. You can click it, um, as you can see there, and it will take you to the Safe Sport courses that you can take. There are two screens that you can access courses from. One is enrolled courses, and one is the catalog. If you had previously completed the NGB1 core course as a coach or as a board member or in whatever role, um, you will see the refresher that you are eligible for that you can take as your enrolled course. So it will take you directly to the brief course that you can take to stay compliant. Um, if you are an adult athlete, you may see the NGB1 course as your recommended enrolled course on the first page do not complete that course. Instead, click on the catalog. You will see what you see here on the right, which is a, a, a bunch of options. And you're gonna look for the green course with the woman who is boxing. It's called the Safe Sport Course for Adult Athletes. It takes only 30 minutes, that is sufficient. What we are working on is an option where um, that course will show as the recommended course for most people that are, that are just athletes. Uh, but there is a bit of a technology delay on the side of safe sport that doesn't allow us to do that right now. Um, but long story short, we want to make sure that when you communicate with your athletes, that you make sure that they know that the adults athlete course is the one that they take, because otherwise they're just wasting time. There is a brief course that is sufficient. It includes all the details they need to know. Um, so don't have them take NGB1. If they do take NGB, uh, the NGB1 core course by accident, that is still enough to be compliant. It's just that they're almost going above and beyond. So we wanna make sure that you, you know, communicate to people not to do that and that the athlete course is sufficient. Um, and then how do I comply? Uh, especially this goes for US rowing regattas at this time. Um, so this Friday, Regatta Central is adding a coach and support staff roster for populating your club's non-athlete adult participants. Um, that is something that we will require for our regattas. So for someone to access the restricted areas of the venue, uh, to be on the dock, they will. their coaches and support staff are going to need credentials, just like athletes are going to get their own wristbands. Um, in order to get that, you'll have to pre-register people so that they can access the venue, and that will allow us to verify that they have safe sport and they've met the requirements that we talked about earlier. Um, so register your athletes as you always do. Um, compliance emails will start going out ahead of regattas, informing you as the person who made the entry of the status of your athletes. If they're all good to go, they're all good to go. But if people have memberships missing, waivers missing, safe sport missing, we will be able to let you know in the coming days. 
especially for those of you that might be coming to the regattas that are happening next week. Um, and for staff, uh, you will fill out these forms. It will allow us to verify that the people that are coming have met all the requirements. Um, and this is really part of Safe Sports um, audit standard that they uh, shared with us last year, uh, which just made it very clear that it's important for us that we track people who have access to um, certain areas of a venue. Um, and this is the way uh, this is the way to do that moving forward. So it'll be a fairly short form. It will add people and you will be able to, or we will be able to see the compliance of those folks. Um, and what are known issues? Some of you might be on this call because you've had athletes or staff running into some problems through the database. Um, one, of the most, one of the most common ones is duplicate safe sport accounts. In the past, you could only access safe sport through their own training. People might have done training in the past, used a different email address, maybe used a nickname as their first name, something like that. And now that they have are also accessing from the US rowing database or they're trying to access it again, but with a different email address, it may be creating multiple accounts um, and our system is unable to recognize, you know, maybe your historic record or your current record as a result. Um, so if you get an error message, you can't see the required training or completing training doesn't appear, don't go and create another account um, and certainly don't panic. Uh, send, us an, an, uh, um, uh, send us an email at members at usrowing.org, include your full name and your member number. Uh, and we are able to review both on our end and in our database, as well as with SafeSport, what your records are. Um, and we, in most cases, are able to solve that problem pretty quick. Um, if a recent training is not recognized, um, don't take the training again. Again, don't panic. Um, it very likely recorded, but it may take a little bit for the two databases to sync up. Um, so uh, again, if it doesn't appear after a day or so, I would say a day at, at you know, kind of, that's, that's the longest time you should wait. Um, send us another email. We can review and see if something didn't sync correctly. Um, but in both cases, if you know you did the training um, and if you did it recently, you just don't happen to see it in our database, um, don't panic. Um, what we want to emphasize is that um, if you have completed the required training, uh, but there's some sort of issue with syncing the two systems, it will not prevent you from competing. We will not tell you that you can't participate. Um, we will simply record your member information and then resolve the issue um, either on site or after competition. Um, what is important to note is that we have the ability uh, to see whether you've started the training, what type of errors that you may be encountering in the system that you try to review. So we have those digital breadcrumbs. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is that if you show up with 20 athletes and tell us, well, we couldn't get in and that's it, we can tell if that's true or not. And we just want to make sure that you know that um, so that uh, we can review what went wrong and we can fix that potentially on the go. But if we can't, that we can fix it afterwards. Um, so uh, again, we want to, we really want to emphasize that don't panic if you have someone who can't access it or someone where it doesn't show up, but you know they did it because we're aware of the technology limitations that you know we're encountering with safe sport and we're working on solutions in some cases they are very simple um and so it's it should never bar like tech, the technology side of this should never bar someone from competing in our events um and that's certainly our message to regatta directors across the country as well um there is one question already in the q a and if you have questions please put them there so that we as the panel can answer them um, and the first question, and I can take it or someone else can jump in, is will Regatta Central have the ability to track safe sport compliance? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, there are a couple of features literally going to be rolled out in the coming days. Um, you may have already used the roster feature um, in our database. Uh, again, our database resides with uh, Regatta Central. They are connected. They, they communicate. If you are an admin for your club, you can log into our database, click on the roster, and in the active tab, there is now a column for safe sport compliance. If someone is under the age of 18, it will not show anything. Um, and if they are 18 or older, it would show whether it's expired, whether they've not done it, or if they're good to go. So the databases already have an ability to tell you for your whole roster who is and isn't good to go. Um, and we are uh, very close to uh, launching a couple of features where um, you can see that specifically for entries moving forward as well. Uh, 
Uh, define direct contact. How are parents at a food tent not direct contact? So Pam, you might want to jump in a little bit. That is a, that is a good question. So direct contact, part of that is, are you in, a, in an authority role where you might be in contact with that athlete in a more one-on-one -on -one setting? Uh, parents at a food tent or someone who's volunteering at an event is more likely to do so in a very, very public space. So direct contact is more about the, the potential one-on-one -on -one or uh, the very small group interactions more so than uh, interactions in a more public setting. And Pamela, if you want to elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, just to add to that, what the center describes as direct contact is in program on a regular basis, direct contact. So if it's a one day regatta, you're at work in the food tent, that's not considered direct contact. And also if you're working at food tent, it is considered open, observable, interruptible. Um, so the center does not require that you take training. However, you are more than welcome to take training if you feel that would be beneficial, but it is not a requirement. Okay. Are there other questions for us? Pamela, this may be one for you. So are rowers who are learning to row required to take safe sport prior to um, their learn to row course or is it only after they officially join a club? It is only after they officially join a club. Um, so basically just like a US rowing membership, we don't require learn to row members to become US rowing members until they actually join the club. So safe sport is the same. Sure. So uh, the focus leans more towards youth. Are these protections extended to all athletes and participants? Um, yes, that's actually probably a pretty important thing to, to talk about for a little bit. The Center for Safe Sport takes on cases both involving the abuse of minors, but also um, certain types of abuse between adults. And unfortunately, and I've, I've said this on prior webinars as well, um, we take on as many cases that involve adult on adult abuse, bullying, harassment, um, as we do potential adult on minors or minors or between minors. Um, so certainly the requirements of safe sport, but also the protections of safe sport and the investigative power of the center for safe sport extend to adults as well. It's important to note that unfortunately misconduct can happen at any level. And just one thing to put out there that is in the context of that as well, in case we haven't mentioned it, U.S. rowing itself is accountable for safe sport compliance. We have uh, camps we host, we have national team ramifications, so we are also an accountable organization um, on behalf of adults and youth uh, for upholding the principles and standards outlined in safe sport. I think the one thing that I'd add to what Tom said is, um, as an organization, we appreciate your support to make sure that we can have everybody compliant. We know that we have opportunities to improve this from an operational and a technology standpoint, and we are working hard with Safe Sport and their technology team um, to get to the point where the friction for everybody to become compliant is much lower, much more seamless. So we appreciate your partnership as we work through this season. Um, and make this easier for everybody in the community moving forward. Yep. And someone made a good point in the Q&A and I should have jumped on that right away. And, and Pamela, this is also for you and for everyone to, to know. Um, our insurance company uh, is, um, it, it does demand that after a third day of participating in any sort of activities, someone becomes a member and has a waiver in our database. So while there is a grace period, if, if someone is doing an extended period of time camp, so say someone is spending a week with you or spending multiple weekends with you, membership becomes required and with that safe sport. So it's not a day one 
element. It's not that someone needs to, you know, have safe sport done and ready before they join your club and they walk into your boathouse to force the first time. But if someone is regularly meeting with you and with your staff and is regularly around other rowers, uh, the, it does become a requirement as it does for all memberships. Um, I saw a great question pop up there about the age of the athlete. So it is based on their actual age, not their rowing um, competition event age. So if the athlete is 18 at the time of the event, they are required to have the safe sport training. Right. That's a great question. Yep. And yeah, and so if an athlete is 18 rowing age because they're turning 18 in the fall, but they are 17 this spring, they do not have to take the training. Um, and there was another question. Someone said, I heard that soon the US ro rowing uh, roster will specify which training a member has completed. Uh, this is already available. So if you are an admin or a coach with access to the roster in the US rowing database, you should be able to click on the roster, go to the active tab, and it should load all the columns. Um, and one of them is a safe sport compliance column. So as long as your coaches, your volunteers, your athletes are all on your roster at this time, you can see who has and who has not completed the training. One thing I just want to add to, um, for those of you I don't know, my name is Sarah McAuliffe. I'm the director of events, so I will be seeing quite a few of you um, at regattas this year. Um, so as you know, as coaches come to the venue, the registration desk is the first um, thing that you see. So for specifically Southwest, Alyssa and I will be at that event. And uh, for the Central Championship, Jules will be there along with uh, our coworker, Paul Wilkins. Um, so what to expect as you come up to our table um, along with any, you know, regatta questions you may have, lineup changes, whatever comes about, um, Alyssa and the rest of the membership team will be checking um, to make sure all athletes are compliant, who do meet the criteria and do need the training, along with the coaching staff on that front. Um, on top of that, too, our referees will be checking wristbands as um, we go down to the docks. So making sure that coaches and support staff um, who are accompanying their boats down on the docks do also have wristbands. Um, and if they don't, they will be stopped as that is one of the restricted areas. So just a note too, at all events, restricted area is a little bit different. Um, so if you have a specific question of like, what's restricted at this specific regatta, I'm more than happy to, to help answer that. Um, specifically youth nationals, it's a little bit clearer because we have a, a fence right down the middle of where the athletes go and where the spectators go. So that's easy, but at our regional championships, it's not as clear. So again, happy to answer that there. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say like really excited to, to have everyone at events. And I know that this is another thing to add to everyone's plate, but we are more than happy to help wherever we can um, and just want to make sure that we're addressing any questions prior to. So when you do get the regatta to the regatta, you can rig your boats and set up your tents and get on the water with ease. Okay. Uh, I want to take um, a couple questions here. So someone asked, would a new 18 year old need to do the 90 minute training because they're no, so no, if you are just an athlete, the adult athlete training is sufficient. So the only people taking a 90 minute training are people in a position of authority. So they are board members, they are staff, they are coaches. Um, they might be the chaperones that are overseeing the youth when they travel, but whether you're a master's athlete or a youth athlete who just turned 18, the adult athlete training includes everything they need to know and everything they need to do. Um, and so uh, that goes like a, basically the rule of thumb is, is all you do row and someone else is coaching you, then the adult athlete training is the one that you're that you're taking. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, there was a question about um, people potentially not reporting um, because they fear it might harm their rowing at a competitive level. And what could we do if if I understand the question correctly, the concern would be that you know, U.S. rowing would take on the case or would investigate it because one of the concerns, if people are concerned about um, basically keeping something confidential, you can take your case directly to Safe Sport. Safe Sport will then investigate the case. 
Um, they will do that with their professional investigative staff, and they don't come back to U.S. rowing unless action is required on our part because of the outcome of the investigation. So if people are worried about basically the rowing community finding out, you can actually file a safe sport complaint completely separate from U.S. rowing. And more importantly, if you believe it to be an abuse case, you should not take it to U.S. rowing or to the Center for Safe Sport, but you should go directly to law enforcement. The, other, the only other thing I'd add there is that a, a key component of safe sporting complaints is retaliation as well. And so while that doesn't definitively make it more comfortable for people to report, that is a very specific area of focus for safe sport to ensure that retaliation does not become a part of the process. I also want to add that a lot of what, what helps in areas like this is trust and transparency from leadership. So if at your boathouse, you have a culture that views safe sport, again, is something we embrace the principles of and we are open about, and the athletes know that, they're more likely to trust the process. Um, whereas if we simply view it as the thing we have to do, you know, then somebody is naturally gonna have some hesitation. As, as we continue to be involved with safe sport and working with safe sport as a, as a, as a rowing, um, entity, I, I think we're also going to find more athletes will have awareness of how the process goes and, and learn not to fear that. But it's going to take time, leadership, and trust. Yeah, um, so the question again is, will the US rowing roster show who has completed it? As I said earlier, it already does. Like if you can, if you log in right now and you go to the active tab, it should allow you to see on the right hand side. And I'll be honest with you, I was in a browser where it wouldn't let me scroll. So perhaps depending on uh, the quality of your screen, it may not load or you may have to scroll for it, but the US rowing roster, um, already shows kind of the, the stuff that they've completed and you should be able to hover your mouse on it and it should show what they have completed. Um, and if it checks as they're compliant, then they've done the right thing. Um, so people, there are two more questions about the, uh, about the membership requirement for uh, like safe sport training for, uh, for people who are learning how to row or who have just joined a club. So um, I, I guess it's, it's one of those insurance things where basically the question is at what point is someone at your boathouse enough that they are part of the risk exposure of your team? Um, we actually are in ongoing conversations with our broker and with our carrier asking these kinds of things. Um, they settled on that as a, a kind of a, an industry standard about the number of engagements that you have with someone before they are considered kind of a regularly recurring visitor to your boathouse. Um, and so that's, that's why it's where it's at. I'm happy to take it back to them, have another discussion, say, can we stretch this to five or six or to a, a, some sort of kind of limited time um, that's a little longer than the three to four days that we're at right now. Uh, the problem is that's been the feedback from insurance uh, uh, carriers, and and that is, it's it's hard to get them to change their minds. Uh, in part because they make calculations based on on industry standards, and one of those is X number of interactions puts you in a different category for them. Um, so that's why that uh, kind of is is at where it's at. Um, so uh, bus drivers are listed to, I think they have to do MAP. Uh, they do not. So as long as the bus driver is aware that you have an abuse uh, prevention policy and they know who to report to if they see something um, and they're a hired bus driver uh, with a company or with the school, um, then they do not have to take the training. Um, it is important that if you have parents driving, say a 10 passenger or 15 passenger van, um, those they will have to take um, they will have to take uh, uh, safe sport training, and in that case, it's the NGB one um, uh, training. So um, just, just to interrupt, Jules, in that in that case, when it's a parent, they are considered a chaperone, and that's why they're required to take training. They're not a paid um, external person. Yeah. Um, 
Question is, is there a fee for this course? No, there is not. As long as you're a member of US Rowing or as long as you, um, if you're a board member or staff and you use the volunteer option, it's actually free to you regardless of how you do this. But as long as you're a member and you're in our database and you've signed your waiver and you have a member number, accessing the courses is free to you. Uh, US Rowing does pay and all governing bodies in the Olympic movement pay fees to the Center for Safe Sport, which is part of kind of the cost of, of membership that we calculate, but uh, it's, it's not a cost to you as a member, as long as you are a member. Um, the question is, how will this be managed for registered regattas? Uh, the, the truth is that these, these compliance requirements should be monitored by the program. So it, we as US Rowing, um, are more likely to be audited. Last year at two different regattas, we were audited directly, um, which is part of why we have this compliance. We also think that with the number of staff that we have at these events and with the interactions that we have, um, this is an opportunity for us to, to work with you on this, uh, to make sure that everyone that comes through our regattas is 100% compliant. But in the end, these compliance requirements come back to um, come back to, to the program directors um, and to coaches and making sure that their roster is fully compliant. Um, and so I don't, what I'm, what I'm really trying to say is I don't wanna put the onus of this on regatta directors who are, um, you know, who, who are taking care of a regatta with perhaps volunteers and a small staff because the onus should not be on them. So if you're running a registered regatta, down the road and and even now like it would be great if you can communicate and say make sure you're compliant with us rowing make sure that everyone has done um this but we're not asking you to deny people access to the event because the club isn't fully compliant like the onus of that is specifically on um is specifically on the clubs and not on you as a regatta director or as a as an event um I, uh, there was a, a follow-up in the chat about what U.S. Rowing can do to make athletes trust that they won't be harmed. Um, perhaps we should take this offline. I, I'm not really sure what your, either your experience is or what, what your question is, because we treat any sort of report that comes in with the utmost co like confidentiality. Um, we follow all the rules as set out by Safe Sport. There are very specific rules as to how we report cases, what we can do. Um, and so, you know, if someone comes to us, we follow a strict set of guidelines as set out by the center. Um, and I think that, you know, that's, that's all we can do. If people have specific questions about what we might do or what we do when they come to us, uh, we're happy to answer those as well. Um, it, you know, that's, that's all I can say about that. But, it, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, otherwise kind of know what, what the question would be here. I just want to say that I trust that um, we, we treat people with the confide confidentiality that they deserve. Um, and, and that's all we can do. I, I see a question there about the efficacy of the 30 minute training. So on the refresher training, as someone who just recently went through it myself, um, you're correct. You're not likely, and that's the purpose of the refresher part. You're not going to learn any, you know, vast new concepts as much as you're going to be reminded of the standards that are in play and up to date if there are any changes to those standards. But that that is the training that Safe Sport has chosen that we're allowed to comply with as a refresher and then the core. But but yeah, you're right. It's it's not a learning module at that point. It is exactly what it says, which is a refresher course. And it's a little bit unclear to me whether the question was about the refresher course or the 30 minute adult athlete training. And just to respond in case it was about the, the adult athlete training, um, Safe Sport tries to target these courses to the specific population. And for that adult athlete population, it's primarily be about navigating power imbalances and really understanding barriers to reporting and creating the response and, and report mechanism. So with the vast number of adult athletes out there, it's really about the, if you see something, say something um, model and how to enable adult athletes to do that and for them to really recognize and understand both the power balances and the risk of retaliation that exists uh, when it comes to abuse reporting. I also want to jump in because someone said, if we're not holding LOCs accountable to the policy, how can we be sure athletes are in a safe environment? I want to emphasize, I was talking specifically about asking our registered regattas and LOCs to enforce 
the uh, rules or to enforce the compliance for the athletes that are coming to the event. Um, an LOC is always a member organization of U.S. Rowing, and we are asking them, as we do with all the other asks that we make of LOCs, um, that they follow this policy. So if they have people who are regularly interacting with athletes, they have to follow this policy as well. What my point specifically was is that at this time, we're not asking regatta directors to run full-on compliance reports on every single person that's coming because we think that, that the lift of that work shouldn't be with them on the day of the regatta, in part because they don't have access to the, to the tech kind of back end that we do to make sure that people are compliant or to check if you know, they should take someone's word that, oh, I tried, but I couldn't get in. Those are not steps that I want a registered regatta to have to take at this point in time, because that's just unfair to them. They can't make that lift on our behalf and they shouldn't be making that lift on behalf of the teams that are attending. So um, we certainly, you know, as far as the safe sport policy applies to organizing a US rowing sanctioned event, it 100% applies, but specifically to registration, we're not asking regatta directors to do compliance checks to the point that uh, they're deciding yes or no, you can't race. The only thing though, right now that we are requiring that our regatta directors do look at is make sure that no one on the organizational exclusion list is attending your event. And that is available on our website. Okay. Oh. Right. Yeah, so there was a comment in the Q&A about, you know, taking taking this back to the insurance company and talking this through with them. And I, I will certainly uh, make an effort. It actually popped up this week and I'm meeting with them later this week and, and uh, I'll put it on the agenda to make sure. So um, I'll see what I can do. All right, folks, I think that's about, I, I think we've wrapped up the questions. Um, if you have anything more, you know, we're, we're all quite available. You can find us pretty easily. Um, I just wanted to say it, it means a lot to me that, again, if you're on this call, you've already demonstrated you're someone that cares about making our sports safer. It's, it's as simple as that. Uh, we, we look around and you can see from the various sports and the national headlines, the risks athletes face, youth and adult, right? And there's a lot of, we want this sport to be the best memory someone has in their life. I, I want every I know as a coach myself that I want every kid to experience the best of what the sport has to offer. And too often when we look the other way or when we, we sort of fail to make good decisions, we're exposing them to really harsh, harsh situations that are damaging. So if we do this right, if we embrace the policies, if we, we genuinely show respect for athletes by caring enough to, to learn what the standard is, but more importantly, enforce it, like live it. Then, then I, we can live without regret knowing that we provided the best opportunity we could as coaches, administrators, and athletes with each other to have a fantastic time as rowers. So I want to say thanks to everybody for attending. Thank you, everybody.